So welcome to this video. Um, so what this video is going to be is it's designed for somebody who knows a, a little bit of maths, uh, really maybe just some undergraduate maths, maybe even first semester undergraduate maths. You should have enough to kind of uh, follow what's going on here. Um, we're not going to worry too much about technicalities or anything like that. Um, now, one thing I do want us to do is to kind of understand these quantum spaces. So what does this quantum mean? And we hear this word quantum and non-commutative. Uh, they're all mixed up here. So we'll try and get some kind of uh, uh, motivation or intuition, which is very difficult for these things, uh, but we'll see what we can do. So the kind of questions we're going to look at, um, probably the hardest here is what is a quantum space? And can we give meaning to this? And what does it mean? Uh, then an easier question is what is a group? And then we'll talk about functions and groups. And then we'll talk about what is a quantum group? Okay. So we're going to start um, getting towards what is a quantum space by talking about observables. Now, all the time we're, we're actually being not technical at all. There's lots of difficulties around this kind of thing. This is some quantum mechanics here. We want to be kind of technical when it suits and um, kind of nonsensical when, when that suits. So this here is, and we're going to use the thetas to kind of stand for a quantum space. So we're going to say that the, this this world we exist in is a quantum. So this is uh, this is kind of real life now, something like this. So these are, you have maybe an electron in a box or some all these different kinds of things, and these are all the states of the system. So the usual thing here would be something like an electron in a box, and you want to kind of find out something about the electron in the box, and how you do that is you make a measurement, and the things that you can measure. Um, are what are called observables and when you make this measurement um, kind of what's happening when you measure it you see that the electron is in a certain state you make the measurement and out pops a real number like kind of like you know before now sometimes you can um, measure um, things simultaneously so for example here if we're thinking maybe about an electron in a box um, maybe some corner of the box is the origin and we pick, you know, X, Y and Z um, kind of axes, uh, we can measure the uh, position um, by kind of measuring um, actually three, three observables would be the X coordinate, the Y coordinate and the Z coordinate. So we separately, we have the electron and we measure all these simultaneously. Um, and it happens for these that okay, you can define then the product of two observables. So we're saying, and again, we have to be very careful about kind of some of this can be nonsense, but we're imagining now that when we measure it, uh, the electron is in some state, which we're calling theta. So we measure, uh, or rather we can define the product of observables uh, x and y if we can measure simultaneously, because we can just take the value of x in the state theta and the value of y in the state theta and multiply them together. And whenever um, the observables can be measured simultaneously, because these are just real numbers, they're commutative. And so we end up here that if you if you look at xy and yx, uh, these are the same observable. So we kind of have a, a thing here that if, if you've got simultaneous measurement, then those, those observables commute. Now, what's a more difficult scenario is non-simultaneous measurement. And this is one probably angle that kind of getting into quantum mechanics is that there's things um, that can't be measured simultaneously. So the classical, <laughs> the, uh, the famous example of this is position and momentum. So if you have an electron in a box, you can measure the, the x-coordinate of the position, that's an observable. Or you can maybe, instead of doing that, you could look at the momentum, which of course relates to velocity, you measure the momentum of the electron, you get out a real number. 
Now, the question is, can we make sense of the product of the position here and the momentum? Um, and the issue really is, this is kind of a question mark, there is no state um, that the, the there's no state that simultaneously the X observable can see and the momentum observable to see. Realistically, what this is saying, there's no state theta um, that simultaneously defines position and momentum, which is very, very different. And if you could kind of think about what this means, it says a lot of uh, other things that you hear about in quantum mechanics. Now, here what I'm doing is I'm putting a question mark here. Now, if, the, if these existed... If you could do this simultaneously, you're getting commutivity. But because there's a question here, maybe these things don't commute. Now, at the moment, I can't say, oh, if, they, uh, if there's no uh, non-simultaneous measurement that the, the observables don't commute. Um, that, but I can actually say that a little bit later. But at the moment, we're just going to say, if you have simultaneous measurements, so this means two uh, observables that you can... Uh, you know, you can multiply them together and it makes sense. This will imply that they commute or perhaps, yeah, this is from up here. So if you simultaneous measurement, they commute. And what that means is in classical um, uh, physics, there's not everything can be measured simultaneously. And so all the observables commute um, in normal classical physics. So... What this means is the quantum state space. Now, the global, what I mean by global is, um, so this is kind of a bit weird. Like, so this, this quantum space, it, it, it's not a set because if it was a set, presumably, you know, we could, we could do this kind of thing. We say, okay, let's, let's, um, let's say x p of theta is x of theta by p of theta. No problem because, oh, it's a set. It x defines a map from the quantum space to the real numbers, etc. But actually, we have to be led to the conclusion that it's not quite like that. There is no global state space that is a set. But what we're going to see is that uh, locally, in other words, just for X, X sees a, a set of states and P sees a set of states. So, for example, if it's the electron in the box and you want to measure the position, um, and maybe it's a 10 centimeter box, you've got all the numbers between 0 and 0 0.1. This would make up this state space. Um, so single observables, when they look at the quantum space, they do see a set. The issue is that they see different sets. Um, you have these, lo now the local here refers to locally to an observable. Okay, so this is a kind of really strange thing. And if you read kind of text kind of, introductory text and quantum mechanics, you'll see stuff like this. So have we any maths for this? So one way that we can do it is kind of use um, self-adjoint matrices. Now I'm using the word toy here because there's really a lot of technical difficulties that are, are not seen here. The, I've got these self-adjoint matrices. I think it, it, for a start, the things that we look at in real quantum mechanics, the real position and momentum, I don't think they're like matrices. Um, so this is just kind of a toy, uh, just a finite version. Uh, just kind of get give you an idea. Um, okay, so what we got here is we got some uh, mathematical theory that says, if you have, um, and I'm using F for suggestive reasons, but if you have a, a matrix with complex entries, that is equal to its conjugate uh, transpose, it, it's a joint, then we've got some theorems going on. It has real eigenvalues, and also it has an eigenbasis. And what I'm proposing is that if you take um, self-adjoint matrix, that the eigenvalues are like the uh, values that the function can take, and these are the different states. These are the states that the observable F sees. And you can say stuff like um, the matrix, uh, if, say, the electron, when you measure it, is found to be in state VI, that when you make that measurement, you get lambda I. Now, th that technically doesn't really work because this uh, is a, a number and this is actually a vector, but uh, you can kind of fix this. It's not difficult using some linear algebra. And um, what that means 
the other thing that we got is um, that it's it's an eigen basis, um, and what that means is that the, this thing is a diagonalizable matrix. If you write um, the matrix with respect to this basis, it's just a diagonal matrix. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that's nice here is that normal classical observables do completely fall into this framework that um, they're self-adjoint, they have real eigenvalues, they have an eigenbasis, um, and the values of the functions are just the eigenvalues. Um, basically, you just do it like this. So, for example, and the, the other thing, of course, is if in classical observables, um, they can be simultaneously measured. There's a global state space, omega, and what you know, you do something like this. So f, you just write it, say, um, as the values of the function along the diagonal, basically. And you can multiply these together and do a bit. You see that they commute, as you'd expect. Um, now, the interesting bit about it is we have some theorems for self-adjoint matrices that if we go back, we were looking at, well, if they commute, does that mean we have simultaneous measurement? And we have something, some theorems like this for self-adjoint matrices. So on the first thing, the observables themselves don't quite form an algebra. So you can't just multiply together any all observables. Like we've seen already that if you take um, position and momentum, and you multiply them together, that's not something you can observe because you can't measure them simultaneously. Um, so this, uh, the space of observables is not an algebra because the product need not have real eigenvalues. And in fact, um, the product, the reason being is that, in fact, you can multiply together self-adjoint matrices and get something that's not self-adjoint. Now, maybe it happened that the, the world is made in such a way that uh, when you have self-adjoint matrices, um, that product has real eigenvalues, but it turns out that's not even the case. And here's our uh, mathematical theorem that kind of gives us what we want. So this is saying that if you've got two observables, then the product will be observable if and only if they commute. And if and only if they commute, what you're going to have is that the, they're going to be what's called simultaneously uh, diagonalizable. So what that means basically, uh, what we want to go back to is we want to say really that if you have an observable, when it comes to looking at the quantum space, it sees a set. What this is saying is that if you've got two observables that commute, they, when they look at the quantum space, they see the same set, and then simultaneous measurement is possible. And then it makes sense to talk about Fg is something that you can observe because you can simultaneously measure F and G and just multiply them together. So this all fits in there. Lovely. So what we're getting at here is um, functions in a quantum space we're thinking that, that they're matrices, self-adjoint matrices. So if I write some uh, notation here, so the classical observables um, are the real valued function on, on a set. Now I'm going to start using the omega for a set and the theta for the quantum space. So the quantum observables should be the self-adjoint um, elements of uh, self-adjoint uh, matrix. Um, and you take them all all the self-adjoint matrices, and that's all the quantum observables. And you could call this the real functions on a quantum space. And the thing is, of course, you take one of these quantum observables, they look at this quantum space, which is not actually a set, but they see a set. Now, there are more functions around than observables. So when you, we, you talk about what we're going to talk about later on, we don't just talk about self-adjoint. We take more than that. And the thing is, there are more functions than observables. So, for example, the al algebra functions on a classical space um, is here. This is uh, the set of functions from omega, the set to the complex numbers. And it's an algebra. You can multiply 
um, these things together. Um, I think one of the things that uh, you do have for in the classical situation is, and again, it's it's as simple as um, in the classical situation, they all commute or there's only one state space or you can observe the two of them. Uh, the point I'm trying to say is when you multiply um, any two observables together, you get another observable. Um, and kind of different but related, um, when you multiply together any two real functions, you get another real function. Now, if you take a, a product of observables, which remember is not necessarily equal to GF, this is a matrix. Uh, it could be non-observable, but you still want to consider it a function. Um, so you're thinking of it as a complex value function. So if you take a quantum space, uh, the algebra functions on a quantum space um, is going to be like uh, a matrix algebra. And so you can think of, say, um, this, uh, the set of n by n um, uh, matrices with complex entries as an algebra function on a quantum space. Um, and all finite quantum spaces would be of this form that they're a direct sum of um, matrix algebras. But the point is, if you take any observable, when an observable looks at the quantum space, they see a set, uh, the set of eigenfunctions, the eigenbasis. So this is um, this kind of weird thing. So this is an image that's often used to kind of talk about this. So say you've got an observer here, I think an observable, and when this is kind of like a, it's supposed to be a quantum space. Um, when an observable here looks at this quantum space, it sees a rabbit, which is a perfectly normal thing, like a set. But an observable over here looks at the quantum space and sees a duck. Now, if this kind of example suggests that maybe, oh, we're just not constructing the quantum space correctly. Maybe there's some kind of a Cartesian product, um, you know, that it can that we can do this with but the more and more you go into this it's 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 futile like really it's it's not a set it, it's uh, what it's going to be is kind of more a hilbert space but anyway so this is just some kind of idea that observers can see the quantum space as a set but they might see it as a different set in which case they can't really agree on something like here this thing might say uh what is the name of the rabbit and what is the name of the, the duck? And there's no agreement. You can't do this at the same time. Right. Now what we want to do is we want to get into talking about groups. So we want to talk about a quantum group. Uh, it'll probably make a little bit of sense. Talk a little bit about groups um, just to kind of introduce them. It's a nice way to talk about them. There, there are other ways of getting into quantum groups. And actually this is one of them. Is, uh, it's through this kind of quantum symmetry groups, which is a nice way, but um, I think what I'm doing here is easier. So one way of kind of thinking about um, groups is that you have a, a set uh, and there's some kind of a structure. And you, if you have bijections that preserve the structure, so this would be the structure would be called an invariant. So uh, here's a set, you apply a bijection to the set, you look at the structure beforehand and afterwards, and if they're the same thing, uh, this is this is basically what a symmetry is. So the group would be the set of all these symmetries. So as an example, um, if you had the set of cards in a deck, um, so imagine you have the, the deck of cards in the order ace of hearts, two of hearts, all the way down to king of clubs, and you did a bijection of the cards. So for example, um, whatever it might be, ace of hearts goes to seven of spades, or rather, the ace of hearts goes to the position of the seven of spades. And if the structure, the only structure is the number of cards, then these things are shuffles. And these are the same as the group S52. You can multiply these um, shuffles or these bijections together, or these symmetries by doing composition. Uh, we have an identity symmetry, which is basically just doing nothing. And you also have 
these things are bijections or functions, they have inverses, this is the inverse of it. So this is one way of thinking about groups. Um, yeah. So what you can do is if you want to study, uh, now here I'm saying X with a, a structure. So this is some kind of classical space. This, there's loads of options here. I mean, this could be a set and this could be the metric on the set, something like that. Um, a million other examples. It could be a set and the topology, loads of examples. One thing you possibly might be able to do is study this classical space by, there's different ways you could do it. One thing maybe, like you could start making measurements. Um, I want to keep it kind of loose here, but you, you can make some kind of measurements, in other words, looking at the real valued functions and studying that might tell you about the space. You could also look at the, the symmetries of the space. That might tell you something about it. Or you could possibly make, uh, and I kind of leave it to you how looking, how measurements of the group, although this is something I need to argue to <laughs> make this in a second, but okay, one thing you could say is, okay, start with the, uh, a deck of cards in a certain known order and do a number of shuffles, which is basically doing a number of symmetries. And then basically in that particular example, the, the, the set and the actual group are kind of the same thing. So to study what's going on in the set is to study what symmetry has been applied. And I'm saying, oh, you can study a space by making measurements. And if the space is kind of the same as the group, you want to study the space as it is the group, you can make measurements of the group. Or I have another example here. Um, maybe, you know, kind of a bit more abstract. You just want to study the classical space, like the, the group itself is a space. Uh, it's got a set, it's got a structure. I mean, this is all the structure. And maybe you just want to study that. And you can study it um, by making measurements, by looking at the observables, or maybe looking at other functions, for example. Um, the other thing that's going on here, kind of somehow in the background, is you've got this duality. Uh, you've got the space and the algebra of functions of it. And often if you know the, well, you'd like to think if you have the space, you know everything about the algebra of functions. But often you can, if you know everything about the algebra of functions, you know everything about the space. That's uh, a duality. So these are, um, this, is, this is a nice way of thinking about groups. Um, this is, you're talking about the group acting on X, etc. Okay. Now, this is all kind of not really technical maths. But now we're going to do a little bit of technical maths. So, let's see. So, can we properly write down the axioms of a finite group? Well, we essentially did it on the previous page when we looked at um, you have a product. It's an associative product. Uh, I forgot to mention associativity, but it follows, the previous page it follows, because um, composition of functions is associative. And this is a, a different way of writing down what a group is. And it's going to lend itself, because what I want to do is, I want to kind of exploit this duality here. I want to take a group, and I want to look at the algebra of functions on the group. And what I want to do, like, how do I know if it's an algebra of functions on a group? Maybe it's just an algebra of functions on a space, just a set with no structure. Um, so what I need to do is the, the additional structure of a group somehow has to be translated into structure up here. And this is what the next few slides are about. Okay, so the first, okay, so we've got um, that the finite group is an object. It's a finite set. That's no problem. So uh, we should know some examples of groups. Um, so the easiest ones just off the top of our head is clock arithmetic. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And you can add, you know, uh, 7 o'clock uh, plus 6 hours is 1 o'clock. That's, that's a group. Uh, or, to be honest, or, uh, orders of the deck is a group, um, if you're thinking in terms of shuffles. But to be honest, everyone watching this probably needs to know what a group is. It would be strange to be looking up videos about quantum groups before you know what a group is. So anyway, let's get on with it. So this is one kind of way of pre pre presenting the axioms. So 
you can use this category theory language, um, which is nice. It's 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 kind of abstract, but this is this is uh, not nonsense. So the group, the elements of the group, which are the symmetries as such, they are they form a set. The M here is your multiplication. This is how you uh, combine two symmetries to get another symmetry. Now this. Now this, uh, if we look at this, uh, it's saying, oh, it's a finite set, and a morphism should be a function from a, um, a set to another set. And the E map here, what it does is it goes from the one element set to G, and what it does is just includes the identity symmetry. And then finally, we have the inverse which uh, map, which is a function from the, the group to itself, where uh, an element is sent to its inverse. So the, the axioms that these um, things hold, which is just, this is just a fancy way of saying uh, the group multiplication, the identity element, and the inverse, the laws they satisfy can be given as this. So this one says, this is associativity. So it just says, okay, you've got three group elements, uh, multiply these two together, and then multiply them together like this. Alternatively, you can multiply the first two together and then multiply these together and you get the same thing. That's just associativity. And this one says, okay, now this bar here is supposed to be an equals. So this says, okay, you've got your group. Um, this as a set is the same as the one element Cartesian product, the group. So this is just ordered pairs where the first thing is a dot and the second thing is an element of the group. It's, it's isomorphic. So um as sets you know say you've got um say g2 g2 is a symmetry um sent to the order pair dot g2 and that's that's a, an isomorphism so then what you do is on this side you apply this e so this is the inclusion of the identity so now what you got up here is actually the identity and any element of the group essentially and if you multiply them together well, the identity times anything, is, this is kind of saying that you get the same thing. And of course, you can multiply by the identity on the right as well. So this is another way of saying the identity law. And then this one, so what's going on here is this delta here is a diagonal map. So if you've got a, a symmetry little g, this will give you a gg. Uh, this s is called the antipode, and what it does is it gives you the inverse. Uh, in fact, this in my thing, this should actually be called just minus one here rather than s but anyway so you got g and g and you apply this map and you get g inverse g and then you multiply g inverse times g multiply them together you should get the identity now what this epsilon does here is it sends g to the one element set and then this e well we know this e it goes uh, from the one element set to the identity and that's the same thing so essentially this is just saying give me uh, an element of the group uh, produce two copies of them uh, give me the inverse and the original group and then multiply them together. So this is actually a, a way of writing the inverse axiom. And as I said, this S should be the uh, inverse map. Now, the thing about this is we can kind of use some category theory, which says that, okay, you've got um, an object, some morphisms, and these are called commutative diagrams. Um, if you have a functor, which to my mind is just um, just a translation of this, uh, it basically preserves the commutative diagrams. That's what a functor essentially does. So that axioms uh, here in finite set can be translated into axioms somewhere else, and we're hopefully uh, trying to get up here. So this is what I'm doing here. So the first functor that we're going to apply is uh, what's called the C functor. Now I will have at the very end if some if you want to see what's this in all done in full detail. I do have some references uh, for this. Uh, I myself in my own PhD thesis have kind of put this all together. Um, so we'll see what we get. So the C functor takes a finite set and gives you a complex vector space. So basically what it does is it says, okay, um, let's, so probably the easiest example would be the, the, um, the, the clock uh, group zero, one two so it's like a, a three hour clock so you know uh, you got zero one two and then two plus one goes back to zero etc so this one you'd map zero to 
what's called delta 0, 1 to delta 1, and 2 to delta 2. And it's just a vector space, and it's got um, uh, its three-dimensional vector space. So this is something that, again, I want, if you're watching this, you probably need to have linear algebra anyway. Um, it tells you what to do with the morphisms as well. Uh, the morphisms are in the category of sets. It tells you what to do with them here. If you apply the C functor to a group, you get what's called the group algebra. Um, and now one thing that's very big in quantum groups, but I won't get into in this video because we're just, while there's some small technicalities here, mostly we're just kind of getting a rough intuition and motivation for what a quantum group is. So uh, again, you can go off somewhere else. There's lots of information on the internet explaining what this is all about. Um, now we do need it to be finite for this to happen. And so what we get is, um, if we go back here, for example, this map here, um, you apply the, the C functor to this and you get a tensor product. And then you apply the C functor to the M and it'll go from CG, tensor CG to CG. And this is, um, now you can see the, um, the normal group multiplication in this, but you're going to have a, a linear expansion of elements of the group essentially being multiplied together. Now, as we said, the group axioms are commutative diagrams. So because we're applying a functor, the group axioms are translated into what we might call C-group axioms or um, group algebra axioms. For example, associativity now looks like this. Now, this nabla here is the the functor, what a functor does is it, uh, it maps the objects to new objects, but also the morphisms. And here's a little morphism, the multiplication. It turns it into this multiplication here. And this is also associative in pretty much exactly the same way. Right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to apply the Joule and the functor. Now here you still need to know some linear algebra. So this uh, endo just means it's going to go from finite dimensional vector spaces to finite dimensional vector spaces. It's contravariant. That means it's going to turn arrows around. So what this means is here, say you're going from um, two, uh, there's two things in the tensor product to one when you do a, a, a contravariant functor, it's going to go from one object to a tensor product of two objects. That's the contravariant bit. Um, so what this does is send a vector space to its joule, and a linear map from u to v gets turned into a linear map from the joule of this to this. And how you do this, a, a nice little arrow would have been nice here, but um, basically you say, okay, so uh, something in the joule of V is something that sends V to the complex numbers. So doing the transpose of this T here says, okay, um, I've got something here that wants to send V to the complex numbers. I'm going to turn it into something that sends U to the complex numbers. And what you do is you give it, uh, you take the object from U, T maps it to V, and then you map from V to C uh, afterwards, because that's what this little verify does. Okay, if we apply this dual endo, funct endo functor to a group algebra, you get the algebra of functions. Now, again, there's a lot of missing details here. So what you get here is, so this is the algebra of complex valued functions on the group. Um, it's a vector space. Um, basically, what you have to do to specify a function is say, what do you do with, say, an element called G2? What's the value of G2? You just have to, and all that is you have to say is, oh, uh, pick a value for that. And then essentially what you're doing is you can write everything in there as a, a linear combination of these delta functions. So delta G is something that's equal to um, zero all the time, except when you give it, uh, when, it when it's applied to, the specific element g, it gives you 1. So, for example, if you want a, um, a, a complex-valued function on a group that's equal to, say, i on a certain symmetry, um, you'd have f equal to lots and lots of stuff, and you'd have i times delta, that symmetry. This carries what's called a commutative C-star algebra structure. 
it's um, the commutivity just kind of falls out as such because you multiply these two things together. Um, well, there's different ways of saying this. We can go back and talk about the um, uh, the self-adjoint elements, but we're not going to do that. It's, it's a simple, like, if you've got f of uh, g by f of h, it's the same as f of h by f of g. Well, that's uh, the wrong example, excuse me. So if you've got, say, f of x, g of x is the same as g of x, f of x. Yeah. So it's commutative. It's uh, got a C-star algebra, so we don't really have to go into what that is here. Um, but... The thing about it is, it inherits from the group axioms via the functor composition, first this and then the transpose, an encoding of the group axioms. So this is what we're talking about here. We've translated the group axioms into algebra functions on the group axioms. And the encoding has the map, so you went from the group multiplication to the nabla to this thing, which is called the co-multiplication. You go from the inclusion of the identity to a C version of that to what's called the co-unit. And then you go from also the uh, the inverse to, and it's called the inverse in the group algebra, and then you get what's called the antipode. And these three morphisms together with this object here, they satisfy the three commutative diagrams that encode the, the group axioms. So these encoded group axioms, the encoded group, are called the Hopf algebra axioms. So the co-multiplication, for example, it looks like this. So we mentioned this uh, contravariance thing. So the nabla goes from here to here. The co-multiplication is going to go from the joule of this uh, to the joule of this. It goes backwards. And the joule of this is the algebra of functions and the group and the joule of this is the tensor product of the algebra functions on the group with itself. So the co-multiplication goes from the algebra functions on the group into a tensor product. And here it is, it looks like this. So here we see the co-multiplication going from um, the algebra functions into this tensor thing. And you can show it has this kind of thing. Now, it kind of looks a little bit like the inverse of the um, uh, multiplication, and it's not a terrible way of looking at it, but it's just we're at the level, it's not the inverse of the multiplication because we're at a different level, we're at an algebra of functions level. But it's not a million miles from that, it's actually the delta function, the co-multiplication of delta g is the indicator function when you use the uh, identification of this with uh, f of g uh, times g, it's actually the delta function, or excuse me, the indicator function of the inverse image of the multiplication of g. <laughs> so it is like, it's a bit like it. So the group axiom of associativity gets uh, encoded by something called co-associativity. And here we said, as we said, the reversal of arrows. Um, yeah, so these group axioms, um, they're called the half algebra axioms and the interaction between this structure and the C star algebra structure. So there just has to be some uh, interplay between them. Um, it gives it the algebra functions on a group, what's called uh, the structure of a finite dimensional C star hop algebra. So the, a finite dimensional C star hop algebra might be another way of looking at a group. Let's see about it. So we, let's just kind of go down here. So um, it turns out that when you've got, now the omega, remember, is going to stand for a classical thing. So these are sets. And we we're just talking about categories of sets originally. So here you've got uh, the algebra functions on one group and the algebra functions on another group. And if they're um, commutative hop algebras, then you can show that they are both algebra functions on groups and that the isomorphism on this level um, corresponds to an isomorphism on this level. And that kind of says that you can uh, reconstruct the um, group from its algebra functions, the C star half algebra structure. So this is, you've got a duality. The group gives you the algebra functions, the algebra functions, you can reconstruct the group. Now, what about quantum groups? Or here we're talking about finite quantum groups. 
it turns out that there exist finite dimensional C star algebras. Now these have to be um, all these C star algebras. We've actually seen them before if we go way back here. So the finite dimensional C star algebras are just multi-matrix algebras. Um, that they're not classical functions. They're not algebras um, of classical functions like this. They're simply not because if they were, um, well, there's lots of things you'd see. For example, you'd see that uh, they all can see the state space as a set. And when they all, when all the functions, or really it shouldn't even be functions, but observables see the state space as a set, then they commute. So if this thing is not commuting, um, they're not algebras of classical functions. So these C star algebras that satisfy the C star hop axioms are algebras of functions on quantum spaces. Right, now let's get some facts. The first fact here that's very important um, is that when this thing is commutative, it turns out that this quantum space, well, it will be a set, but in fact, it's more than a set. It's actually a group. So that is good. Um, and the other thing, well, we've mentioned this already, when you've got, yeah, we've mentioned that bit already. Now, what you can do then, if you think about it, and what do you think, especially if you start looking at, we were talking earlier about quantum symmetries, which we didn't quite touch on, it was a different direction. This is a good definition of what a, a finite quantum group should be. So we call these C star Hopf algebras, they're algebras of functions on finite quantum groups. So this Q thing here, um, I kind of, in my own work, I before called this a quantization functor. All this is doing is it's taking you, it's the way of bringing you from the um, space to the algebra functions on it. So we've we've kind of described this. Now, if you, we said that this thing we wrote down, we, we looked at all the axioms. Now, if you look at all those half, C star half axioms, well, one of the things is you don't get commutativity for free. You only get the commutativity if you come from here. So we say, well, what about C star half algebras? Well, you get more of them. And they are, from the discussion that we've said before, they are uh, algebras of functions of quantum spaces. And we say, OK, well, let's say that these things, the quantum spaces are actually quantum groups. Now, one of the things that when I was doing these slides, I got a little bit excited so remember earlier we said, OK, you've got a, a quantum space. And if you have an observable, when the observable looks at a quantum space, let's go back on this. When an observable looks at a quantum space, it sees a set. And I got very excited for a moment because what I thought might be possible was that when you take an observable in here, which is a self-adjoint thing, maybe the set that it sees has a group structure. And that would have been really, really cool. That a, a quantum group, or in this case, a finite quantum group, um, when you take, uh, when you look at an observable, that the observable looks at the quantum groups and sees a group. But it's, alas, it's not a case. Now, again, you do see a set, but you don't see a group. Now, this is... Um, this is kind of how I think about quantum groups. And I think it's a very nice way to think about quantum groups. And it's the kind of thing that I'd like to have seen uh, this kind of a talk when I saw quantum groups first. Now I'm going to talk to talk to some further reading, but then we're kind of going to go back and there's going to be a little um, comment to make. So the further reading is certainly the kind of technical slides, if you want to see them in a bit more detail. Um, Section 1.4 and Chapter 2 of this will give a bit more detail and it'll give examples of these finite quantum groups. So there's uh, the group algebras themselves are actually quantum groups. Um, and then you've got other objects. There's something called Katz-Palyukin quantum groups, the kind of quantum groups. 
and uh, this thesis has some of these. Now, unfortunately, after working with my thesis, so finite quantum groups is what I work on, it really it's not, finite is far too restrictive. Um, if you go down the quantum symmetry route, you can look at something as simple as just a finite set, one, two, three, four, and you look at the quantum symmetries. Um, now, again, that's a whole other video, but it turns out that this thing is infinite. So really, like, you want to think that the symmetries of a finite set, say the classical symmetries, um, should be finite, but it turns out they have kind of infinitely many quantum symmetries. So finite quantum group is not, is technically, um, it's technically a generalization of finite groups, but it's not, it's not a perfect one. Uh, what you have to do is look at what are called compact quantum groups, and you want to look at the uh, Voronovitz types. Now there's matrix um, compact quantum groups, there's C star algebraic uh, compact quantum groups, there's algebraic compact quantum groups, and most of them, and I think this is important for me, there's, a, like this is more or less technically a definition of, uh, even though it's not all written down, finite quantum groups. Uh, a moral definition for me of a quantum group is um, it's some class of objects where you these two facts hold. So what we did here doesn't hold, for example, for um, compact groups. Uh, the, the There's a little isomorphism. This doesn't hold if you've got compact groups. So you don't consider all the functions. Uh, you just look at maybe the continuous functions, something like that. So in these things I mentioned, so the um, C star algebraic compact quantum groups, the matrix compact quantum groups, and the algebraic compact quantum groups, I think for pretty much all of these, whenever they, in those definitions, whenever the algebra of functions is commutative, um, it turns out that, well, you still most of the time in the background, you can use what we said uh, previously, that if it's commutative, then there's a single global state space. So it is an algebra function on a set. And in fact, you inherit in a very natural way uh, structure that it is an algebra of functions on a group. I think that's very important for any definition of quantum groups. And the other thing is that um, you can you get this duality that if you have two objects, so these are actually commutative algebras that are isomorphic as some class of compact quantum group, that you can recover the classical group in the sense that uh, these two things would be isomorphic. So for me, that's the really important thing. And so that basically this picture uh, always makes sense. Now this does so this might be all the functions, uh, maybe just some of them, um, but you can kind of reconstruct down here, and you're still thinking about your algebra functions uh, on the um, quantum group in the same way. Um, yeah. So the other reading. Um, so you want to start looking at this compact things if this is interesting or if this is too baby for you. Uh, there's some great videos on this website here. Um, strange person doing some videos. Um, it's a good place to look. Uh, I like chapter two in this. It kind of does a lot of the stuff here where I would tend to go slower than a lot of references. In chapter two of this, it goes quite slow. If you're getting into the compact where you really, uh, these facts are very important to you, uh, I think this reference is fantastic. Um, so, for example, um, there's a definition of Voronovitz of a C star algebraic oh yeah, uh, compact group. And just to show that it um, does this and this is kind of nice stuff. Um, so I recommend that. Uh, these are, I haven't looked these notes, but uh, this uh, French mathematician is superb. And this is just, it seems an amazing text. Now, pretty much everything else um, can be found in, um, so as a mathematician, Theo Banica, he's keeping some fantastic resources. And on his blog, he has this intergalactic page, and this has absolute reams of references. Now, I hope you find that a bit intriguing. So you want to get away and be thinking, okay, 
Um, probably the big takeaways is it's okay to think of these matrices as functions. They're functions in um, quantum spaces, and that's okay. Um, maybe if you want to go and actually do some maths and try some exercises, I have a challenge for you. So the challenge would be as follows. Go into um, sections 1.4 and 2 of this thesis and look at the katz pal yukon quantum group. And what I want you to do for the algebra of functions on the katz pal yukon quantum group, I want you to um, find an observable. Uh, so that will be a self-adjoint um, element of this algebra of functions. You should be able to find one and um, so the so so these things remember are matrices and we can talk about bounded operators on Hilbert space and stuff. So the these matrices are I think six by six matrices actually. You kind of think it's eight by eight, but they're six by six. But anyway, find one of the self-adjoint ones and show that when that observable looks at the Katzpal Yukon quantum group, that it doesn't actually see a group. Find the set that it sees and show that it's not a group. Now, how do you do that? Well, in this case, um, you can do the same thing. So take the algebra of functions and put it in, um, put it in matrix form. Um, then using the co-multiplication, there is a way of defining um, a, a group law on, for an observable, remember you got this eigenbasis for elements of the eigenbasis that is exactly the same as the group multiplication in here. Try and do it for cats, pal, you can for a real observable and show that it doesn't work. That would be your take home uh, homework. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I hope it's thought provoking. And I hope it's interesting. Thank you.